Institute, Institute lecture uh, uh, with the title "The Art and Science of Research." Uh, we are my name is Shantanu Roy. I'm the dean of academics at Delhi, and uh, it is my real pleasure to welcome Professor M. Ram Murthy from Queen's University, Canada. Uh, Professor uh, Ram Murthy is a mathematician of great repute. But today he will be covering a more generic uh, topic that is of great interest to all of us in the academic community, uh, namely the art and science of research. And uh, we particularly looking forward to hearing from Professor Ramu, a very distinguished researcher himself. And uh, I think it is also a great uh, occasion for our PhD students, our research scholars, to learn from him as someone as distinguished as Professor Ramu on on the whole, uh, you know, the, the act of doing research and how to do effective research and so on. So we all look forward to the talk and uh, to formally welcome Professor Ramurthy. I would request our director, Professor V. Ramadupal Rao, to say some opening remarks. Yeah, thank you, Professor Shantanu Rai. would like to welcome Professor M. Ramurthy, uh, Queen's University, Canada, for this institute lecture. The talk uh, on which he is uh, going to give this seminar is something very important and very appropriate the art and science of uh, doing research. In fact, IITs, as uh, you know, started as undergraduate institutions. So now we have made the transformation uh, to a full-fledged research university. At IIT Delhi, if you see, we have over 60% of students as masters and PhD, and only about 40% of our students are undergraduate. And today we have close to 3,500 PhD students on our roles, uh, including 100 or so uh, postdoctoral fellows. And uh, I think uh, doing research for many is publishing a paper, but I think research, you know, at least to many of us is more than just publishing a paper. The papers that are relevant, the papers that are impactful, papers where we choose, uh, you know, fields where it can impact the society. I think as an institute, we want to go beyond just publishing papers. And uh, I think we are all looking forward to Professor Ramurthy's talk as to how you know one can go beyond uh, uh, counting research papers. And uh, so we are all looking forward to it, uh, Professor Ramurthy. Thanks for taking time and addressing all of us uh, here in India. And uh, thank you very much. Yeah, I would now like to uh, welcome Mr. Jyoti for taking us forward. Okay. So, uh, thank you, Professor Rao and Professor Roy, for your introductory remarks. So, let me begin by uh, noting my deep sense of gratitude to Professor M. Ram Murthy that he agreed to give this lecture. Professor Murthy is a brilliant scholar of mathematics, an excellent expositor, and a great teacher, and an extraordinary researcher. Besides mathematics, he has uh, a profound understanding of Indian philosophy. Professor Murthy obtained his PhD from Massachusetts. Institute of Technology in 1980. He then had uh, postdoctoral stints at Institute for Advanced Study, Princeton, and Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai. He was a professor at McGill University for 14 years before moving to Queen's University, where he is now A.S.B. Douglas Distinguished University Professor and Queen's Research Chair. He also holds a joint appointment in the Department of Philosophy there he has also been uh, adjunct professors at several institutes in India, namely Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai, Institute of Mathematical Sciences, Chennai, Chennai Mathematical Institutes, Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay, etc. Professor Murthy has been awarded with many distinguished prizes like Coxter James Prize, Balagar Prize, etc. He has been elected as the Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, Fields Institute, Indian National Science Academy, American Mathematical Society, Canadian Mathematical Society, etc. He has also received many prestigious fellowships like the Simmons Fellowship and others. Professor Murthy has written more than 250 research articles, including papers in Annals of Mathematics, Inventionist Mathematica, etc. He has made fundamental contributions on topics like Artin's Conjecture on Primitive Roots. Professor Murthy so far has written 14 books, including a book on Indian philosophy. He has supervised 23 PhD students 
and more than 35 postdoctoral fellows. His dedicated uh, supervising was recognized by Queen's University in the form of the award named Excellence in Graduate Supervision. I am therefore extremely glad to have Professor Murthy to kickstart this semester with this thought-provoking talk on the art and science of research. I hope all of us will benefit from this, especially the students in the audience will take inspiration from his lecture to do excellent research in future. So for our viewers uh, on YouTube and participants on WebEx, please put your questions on the chat box. I will pass them to Professor Murthy in the question and answer session. So over to you, Professor Murthy. Yeah, I think before I request Professor Murthy to speak, I would like to request our head mathematics department, Department of Mathematics at IIT Delhi, Professor Dharmaraja is here. So Dharmaraja, would you like to uh, say a few words? Yeah. So thanks, Professor uh, Sandhanan. Thanks, Professor uh, Rao. So I'm happy to introduce our uh, guest and he's a very uh, expert in number theory and uh, based on this talk our research scholars will get more benefit about uh, how we can do the better research and uh, as Professor uh, Rao said. So we welcome on the behalf of the Department of Mathematics. Thank you sir. Thanks. Yeah, over to you Professor. Okay, okay. well. Thank you very much. I, I thank uh, the Institute for um, the kind invitation to speak with you. Um, the Zoom sessions um, has been uh, very, um, uh, I would say, tantalizing. At least uh, we're able to connect and uh, communicate. Uh, it's not as good as being there in person, but it's perhaps the next best thing. Uh, so. Uh, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the art and science of research, and let me begin with a disclaimer. Uh, this talk doesn't claim to give a recipe on how to do research. Okay, so that's uh, first uh, disclaimer. If there was such a re recipe, then we can program computers to do research, and at the moment, that's not the case. Uh, there are some experiments in artificial intelligence where computers have come up with theorems, but the theorems are extremely boring and uninteresting. So there's something about the human mind that is missing in the computer. Uh, so question is, how to do research? Well, there's some general principles, even though I don't have an algorithm to propose to you, I can discuss some general principles that you can apply irrespective of any field. And I'll try to outline these principles and give illustrations from science generally and more specifically from mathematics. Uh, the basic tools for research are the mind, and the mind's movement in time called life. So these are the tools. So these are the only tools we have actually. The tool is your own mind and your own life. So uh, what you make of it, it depends on what you discover. So the purpose of life according to the type three Upanishad is meant for two activities, study and teaching. Swajaya pravajanabhyam na pramaditavyam. That is the verse. Its basic translation is do not refrain from study and teaching. So it's a very profound instruction. Uh, the Upanishads are full of such uh, nuggets of wisdom. And this is uh, certainly one of the best um, uh, verses that I know in the entire um, uh, literature of the Upanishads. The human being seems to be an organism that's ideal for this purpose. What is the purpose? Study and teaching. In other words, life is meant for education and more importantly, perhaps self-education. Who is being educated? Yourself. How are you being educated? By processing life's experiences. So a great sage once expressed this beautifully by saying, as long as I live, so long do I learn. So the human organism as being distinct from other biological organisms seems to be um, created for the purpose of learning. And this is the reason that human beings have been endowed with this marvelous instrument called the mind. And all of us are where we are today because of our mental development. Whatever we want to study, the tool is the mind. Okay, so now in the study of mathematics, which I want to kind of focus on in this talk, it's somewhat holds an exalted position 
par uh, pardon me for the bias, but it, but this is a fact of life. Uh, mathematics seems to hold an exalted position different from the study of anything else, such as the other sciences like physics, chemistry, or biology, or the subjects of the arts like literature, history, or the social sciences. Mathematics seems to be both an art and a science, and no other sub subject seems to enjoy this status. Uh, even, even philosophy doesn't seem to enjoy this, this status. Mathematics seems to have a unique position in the whole galaxy of knowledge. So the study of mathematics requires a mind that is not only scientific, but also artistic. And we not only want to prove theorems, but we want to prove beautiful theorems, and we want to get beautiful proofs, whatever that may mean. And we all know that beauty lies in the eye of the beholder. So part of education is learning to see beauty. So let's, let's, let's discuss a little bit about the artistic side of research. The mental development needed to do mathematics is different from the mental development needed to pursue for the pursuit of other branches of learning. On the one hand, we need to have a high order of logical thinking, which is essential in all of the sciences. On the other hand, we need to have a high order of a sense of beauty or aesthetic delight. So this talk is about how to cultivate both of these qualities so that the graduate student or researcher uh, or engaged in research, whatever that world, uh, word may mean, so that it becomes a little easier. So this is what I call the art and science of research. Now, what is the ABC of research? Well, what are the essential qualities we need to bring into our mathematical study? There are three. The first is attention. In Sanskrit, the word is avadhanam. Second is beauty. The Sanskrit word for beauty is anandam. And third is classification, adhyayanam. That's the idea of classification. Notice the word adhyaya, swadhyaya appears in the Patanjali Yoga Sutras, study and self-study. So the idea of looking at things, organizing your knowledge somehow leads to new knowledge. So these three qualities are not linearly organized, but they're rather simultaneously developed. So you need to develop attention and beauty uh, seem to be intertwined. As you pay attention, the more beautiful the thing becomes. As you appreciate the beauty, the more the attention flows. And somehow through that comes an understanding and you begin to uh, classify. Now, important quality that needs to be cultivated with respect to the third step is to get the habit of making notes or having notebook uh, to systematically cultivate all of these three qualities. Now, most of you know, for example, the famous Ramanujan notebooks. Uh, if you look at Ramanujan's notebooks there, he was thinking out loud. And uh, if such a great mathematician like Ramanujan uh, had uh, systematically, uh, you know, uh, compiled his own notes, uh, what to speak of us lesser mortals. So all the more reason we should uh, cultivate the habit of uh, making notes. So the preparation for discovery, uh, first step is in, in mathematics is to find some mathematical theorem that you find beautiful or remarkable. And of course, you can apply this to the other sciences as well. But as I've pointed out at the beginning of this talk, I'm focusing on mathematics simply because it seems to have both these artistic uh, and, and um, scientific aspects. So once you find something beautiful, there it is on the mathematical landscape, like a Himalayan peak, you can, and you can gaze at it in wonder and awe. And that's an important aspect of the discovery process. The appreciation of beauty is an important part. And as you gaze attention, you begin to see a path on how to explore it further. You discover the steps, classification, to, be, to climb upwards, and slowly a theory starts to emerge. So let me now discuss, uh, having discussed the art of science, uh, art of research rather, let me now discuss the science of research. Now research asks, uh, begins by asking good questions. That's the essence of research. Method of questioning is the way to gain knowledge in all philosophical and scientific traditions. 
But these can't be idle questions or speculations. They must be precise and have a singular goal of achieving a greater understanding into the nature of things. As this is a mental process, it requires energy and stamina. And that can only be described as churning of the mind. Now, in the uh, Vishnu Purana, there's a famous story called the Samudra Mantam. It's a remarkable story, and whoever thought of this up is a, a super genius. Um, the Devas and the Asuras want Amrutam, which is, of course, symbolic of knowledge. And they realize they have to churn the ocean, but they have to join forces. At first, the toxic Halahala appears, and Siva has to rescue them by drinking it and actually holding it in his throat. And then as they continue the churning process, all sorts of divine knowledge appears, knowledge of medicine, the knowledge of science, the knowledge of mathematics, and so on and so forth. All these wonderful gems of knowledge appear. So in this particular story, we see um, the psychoanalytic dimension of the process of discovery. The, um, uh, the devas and the asuras are, are good and bad habits. Uh, our good habits propel us upward. Our bad habits um, propel us downward. And the fact of the matter is both coexist in the mind. And now, uh, they, if you think about it, the good habits are energies in one direction, the bad habits are energies in the other direction, but this the underlying unifying uh, aspect of both is that it's energy. And the energy has to be combined with a singular purpose. So the energies that are misspent by the asuras has to be focused in a, in a co concrete, constructive direction with the goal of trying to get higher knowledge. Now, at the beginning, uh, all sorts of toxic aspects appear. Um, you have a very good uh, goal in mind, but then uh, laziness creeps in, um, procrastination creeps in, all sorts of distractions creep in to impede you from making further discoveries. So somehow you have to kind of go beyond that and, and um, uh, continue the churning process. So this uh, Samudra Mantan story is uh, a very profound uh, psychoanalytic explanation of churning the mind to make discoveries. I'm not, I'm not making this up. If you think about it, you know, Dhanavantara is one of the gems that comes up. The Dhanavantara is basically the science of medicine. Uh, Saraswati comes up, and Saraswati is, of course, all knowledge, and so on and so forth. So uh, perhaps as a homework exercise, you can go and uh, look at all the jewels that came out of the churning process, and finally the Amritam that appears, and try and understand the psychoanalytic significance of the story. As far as we're concerned in this particular talk, our question then is how to churn the mind, how to ask good questions. Good, asking good questions is the part of the churning of the, uh, of the mind. So uh, this is essentially another modernist picture of the churning of the mind. So you, Now you may be wondering, where is Vishnu in all this? Well, Vishnu is the turtle that's holding everything up. The uh, mountain here is Mount Meru, so Vishnu is here. Uh, as you know, the Dasavatara, the second avatara uh, after the Matsya avatara, which is the fish, uh, is the tortoise, uh, which is the, um, the amphibian. And so you have um, an interesting uh, theory of evolution uh, kind of uh, encapsulated in the, in the process of the Dasavatara. So I'll present now here an eightfold way of asking good questions of essentially uh, churning the mind. The answers may depend on how you identify yourself. So your self-identification uh, may influence, or if you think of yourself as a mathematician, you may look at that question from a mathematical perspective. If you think of yourself as a physicist, you may look at it from a physics perspective and so on and so forth. So let's begin with an example. Let's ask the question, what is two plus two? Well, if you, are an engineer, you'll take out a calculator and find the answer is 3.999. If you're a physicist, you will run an experiment and find the answers between 3.8 and 4.2. And the mathematician says he doesn't know, but can show the answer exists. The philosopher 
asks for the meaning of the question. And the accountant asks, what would you like the answer to be? So this is uh, an answer depending on your identifications. So we have to be aware of this process. Uh, this is all through the Upanishads. They, they say what, how you identify yourself depends on how, what kind of answer you, you will get to your question. So here's the first and the most perhaps simplest method of asking questions, churning the mind. Uh, the first method is survey method. So the idea is to, it, it, to survey a topic. It consists of two steps. First, you gather okay. facts, and then you, you organize them. And so gathering of the facts and organizing them. So it's a lot of things which seem to be unrelated start becoming related. Arrangement of ideas leads to knowledge and understanding. In fact, uh, I believe it's Henri Poincaré who uh, goes even further and says knowledge is nothing but the arrangement of ideas. Well, I, I wouldn't uh, leave it at that. I think there's a little bit more than that. I think there's the aesthetic dimension that, and the philosophical dimension that I was trying to underscore in the previous slides. So in the process of arranging ideas, somehow missing ideas are revealed. And that's the process of discovery. It's like having a lot of stuff on, on your table. Once you organize them, put it into various piles, all of you find that, aha, there's the paper that I was looking for the other day. So a superb example of this process of discovery is the, the discovery of the periodic table in, in chemistry. Uh, so most of you know that Dmitry Mendeleev um, uh, organized uh, the existing knowledge of uh, the chemical elements and was surprised to find the periodicity in their properties. Now, Dmitry Mendeleev was not a, a professor in a university. He was actually a high school teacher uh, who was trying to teach uh, his students about the basic properties of chemical elements. And in trying to do it in a good, in the best way that he could, he wanted to organize the properties and all of, lo and behold, he found uh, in trying to write a book, uh, actually student text in chemistry, Mendeleev decided to gather all the facts and known about the elements and organize them according to their atomic weight. Lo and behold, uh, he discovers the periodic table. The periodic table now sits as the presiding deity in all chemistry labs. So each discovery of a missing element. So in this process, he managed to, um, you know, conjecture that there's some elements missing. And at the time that uh, Mendeleev had compiled his uh, periodic table, there were only 60 elements. And as we all know, it's about 93 natural elements now. And every time somebody discovered a new element, uh, they ended up getting the Nobel Prize in chemistry. So this is a profound uh, example of how the survey method organizing the existing knowledge that you have leads to uh, new knowledge. The second method of uh, churning the mind is to observe carefully. Uh, careful observations lead to the discovery of patterns and patterns lead to the question of why, opening the door for the underlying theory that explains the patterns. Here, an excellent example is the um, uh, experiment with Michelson and Morley in physics, that the speed of light is constant, independent of any relative motion of the observer. So if you had a stationary um, clock, here's a stationary clock, and here's a light particle that's being sh shown, they computed the speed of light. Um, and if you had a clock that moves with the, with the thing and tries to calculate the speed, according to uh, Newtonian uh, physics, the second model should have um, uh, 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 a higher speed uh, for for light, but uh, it didn't, and uh, the speed of light came out to be constant. And uh, we'll talk about this a little later, but I want to kind of fuse the observation method with the conjecture method. So conjectures uh, are a natural outcome of careful observations. Uh, the Michelson-Morley experiment could not be explained in the uh, realm of Newtonian physics, and so they were led to conjecture that there must be a larger theory that will explain the observations. Now, Newtonian physics took space and time to be absolute, fixed, and from this standpoint, the Michelson-Morley experiment uh, is a contradiction, and therefore, it only shows that the, start, uh, the, uh, that the axioms was wrong. Startling axiom is then that space and time are not absolutes. They seem to conspire 
to ensure the constancy of speed of light, whether the observer is in a moving frame or a stationary frame. So I want to kind of put this in front of you to show you uh, this uh, careful observations led to uh, a conjecture of a, a higher theory. Of course, we all know this is relativity theory, but at the time the Michelson Morla did the experiment, uh, this was not known. So in, in mathematics, I just want to highlight uh, one remarkable uh, contribution of Ramanujan. So there's Ramanujan. In 1916, he was studying the coefficients of a certain infinite product, and he observed some remarkable properties. So what's the product? Well, if you take Q and multiply it by 1 minus Q, 1 minus Q squared, 1 minus Q cubed, dot, 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 all raised to the power 24, you'll get a power series in Q and the nth coefficient he designated as tau of n. Now, Ramanujan didn't have paper. What he would do is he would write on his uh, slate. Um, so in, on his slate, he would make these calculations. Obviously, he had to write small because the slate was not that big. But he calculated about 30 of the coefficients. And you notice that uh, if you take the second coefficient, which is minus 24, and the third coefficient, which is 252, and multiply these two together, you end up getting the sixth coefficient. So he started noticing patterns with these huge numbers. And uh, these um, were enunciated in the form of three conjectures, namely that somehow tau is multiplicative. Tau of mn is tau of m times tau of n. That's what he noticed. And he kept on making more and more calculations and he kept finding this pattern that tau is a multiplicative function. Now, why in the world would you think tau is a multiplicative function just from this product? There's really no rhyme or reason for such an expectation, but that's a fact. That's a numerical fact observed uh, because uh, Ramanujan was not averse to making calculations and he noticed these patterns. And he also noticed that every time you look at um, prime powers, the values of tau at the prime powers, they seem to satisfy a second order recurrence relation. And then he made a third conjecture that if, you, if p is a prime number and you look at tau of p, it's always less than two times p the 11 over 2. Now, these are the conjectures he noticed and made. Um, surprisingly, they turn out to be a very profound conjectures. And these innocent-looking conjectures transform the entire uh, 20th century mathematics. So these conjectures led to the development of now called the theory of modular forms. And most of you probably know that the theory of modular forms is really central in not only mathematics, but apparently in physics right now, uh, even the phenomenon of black holes and um, uh, string theory are using the theory of modular forms or more appropriately, the theory of mock modular forms, which Ramanujan discovered on his deathbed. Um, these seem to be uh, entering into uh, explanations of um, things that are um, still baffling many physicists. So uh, now, so I've discussed observations and conjectures, and then I want to move into another method of churning the mind, which is more difficult. It's called the method of reinterpretation. The method of research, uh, this method of research examines traditional concepts and tries to look at them in a new light. I mean, this cartoon, I'll show you a cartoon in a second, I will show you. Such a method does not negate past in understanding, but expands it and sees it as a special case of a larger a phenomenon. The Michelson-Morley experiment forced physicists to re-examine Newtonian physics and to question the fundamental axioms. What is space? What is time? We just think of these as absolute, but uh, these were the questions that were raised by the Michelson-Morley experiment. First and foremost were our notions of space and time. So the special theory of relativity, as most of you know, was the uh, remarkable discovery of Einstein. Um, in that theory, we postulate that time dilates and space contracts so that the speed of light is constant. It's an amazing, it's an amazing idea. Uh, so his theory reinterprets space and time, but they're not absolutes, nor are they independent. They don't seem to be independent. You know, we think of space and three-dimensional space and time. No, it's not that. They seem to be interdependent. And now we speak of what's called uh, in uh, Einstein's theory, um, once you've revolutionized your notions of space and time, it now revolutionizes your notion of gravity as well. 
gravity is not a force, but a curvature of space. So if you have, for example, an object here, uh, it's so heavy that uh, it curves the space, and that curved space is what's called the gravitational field. So for example, if you have a sun, it's uh, sitting on this, uh, what you may call the trampoline of space-time, uh, four-dimensional manifold. It sits, it's, the sun is sitting on the thing, it distorts space, and now uh, the planets move along these curved uh, paths. Uh, it's just a visual thing, don't take it so literally, but that's the idea behind this uh, thing of notion of uh, gravity as, as curvature of space. That was a prediction that was made by the early 1900s uh, by Einstein's theory of relativity. And then uh, in the 1930s, they wanted to see whether this is actually true or not. And they found uh, experimental evidence where uh, our own sun bent light coming from a distant star. And normally here's the earth and we shouldn't really see that star because it's behind the sun and yet we could see it and the gravitational field of the sun deflected it so that we saw it as if it was uh, there. So this is a, a remarkable discovery that was made in the 1930s. This was followed up by Subramanian Chandrasekhar who started understand, trying to understand the birth and death of stars. So when the star dies, the gravitational field, uh, the, the star is so massive that the gravitational field compresses to a point, which, uh, and he, he, was, he predicted the existence of black holes in 1938, and it was only in the 1980s that there was some um, experimental evidence to support uh, Chandrasekhar's um, discovery, theoretical discovery of 1938, and finally, I think it was in 1984, 83, that he got the Nobel Prize in physics for this um, discovery of the existence of black holes. Now, uh, in the context of reinterpretation, uh, re, uh, re let me show you this cartoon, which is embodies the essence of reinterpretation. Uh, we always talk about un unanswered questions as uh, the being uh, the goal of research, but uh, in reinterpretation, it's the unquestioned answers that we have to look at. Um, in this context, perhaps all of religion falls into the category. Religion seems to give all the answers. Well, maybe, maybe we should question some of those answers. And in that process, we will be able to churn our mind and make more discoveries. So the, this cartoon depicts the essence of the method of reinterpretation. It tries to see familiar things in a new light. Um, takes the well-known theorem and says every natural, as an example, let's take the well-known theorem and say every natural number can be written as a product of prime numbers uniquely. We all know that. Uh, it's called the unique factor theorem. Let's try to see that in a new kind of light. Is there a reformulation, a reinterpretation that will lead to a higher understanding? So here's um, the first uh, version of this uh, comes from Euler. Euler discovered that unique factorization can be written analytically. Was a picture of Euler. So he would write all the natural numbers, not as one, two, three, dot, dot, dot. He will write them as one plus one over two to the S, one over three to the S, and one over four to the S, and dot, dot, dot and think of it as a function of the variable s. And then the unique factorization theorem he expressed as an infinite product over primes of one over one minus one over p to the s. Now, um, this is the unique factorization theorem expressed analytically. So this reformulation opens the door to study prime numbers by analytic methods. And uh, Euler's observation, um, set the uh, foundation for a new branch of mathematics called analytic number theory. So if we try to reinterpret Ramanujan's conjectures in, in the light of Euler's discovery, we find that uh, uh, similar to the zeta function, zeta one over summation one over n to the s, we find summation tau of n over n to the s. Remember that tau function that was the coefficient of that power series of Ramanujan. Uh, and uh, Ramanujan says, Conjecture about multiplicativity and the second order re relation, the first two conjectures, can be reformulated as saying that these two are equal. So it's not uh, that we have that, but the, the first two of Ramanujan's conjecture can be reformulated as saying that the sum and the product above are equal. And the first two conjectures were proved by Mordell in 1917, but Mordell never asked himself what was the underlying theory behind it. The person who discovered the underlying theory is Eric Hecker, 1936, 
and he gave the theoretical basis for Ramanujan's discoveries, and now we call it Hecker Hecker theory. Now, if Mordell had done it earlier, we might have call, been calling it the Mordell theory, but um, there's always more to discover um, beyond just proving things. And the third conjecture was a big tour de force uh, solved by Galin in 1974 using uh, very powerful algebraic geometry. So you can see Ramanujan's conjectures formulated as early as 1916 more or less transformed much of mathematics uh, in a very positive direction. And even now we are still continuing um, the research program initiated by Ramanujan. Okay, now the fifth method of churning the mind is the method of analogy. So what you do here is you detect similarities between two seemingly separate ideas and try to find an underlying theorem, uh, an underlying theme which, which unifies both of them. So for instance, we see some similarities between the Euler product or the zeta function and the Ramanujan product. So we see that zeta s is summation one over nvs, and we have some similarity with summation tau n over nvs. Here we see it's an infinite product over primes, and we seem to see that it's also an infinite product over primes, this tau. Um, here it was a linear poly polynomial in one over p to the s. Here it seems to be a quadratic polynomial in one over p to the s. So there se seems to be some analogies between the two, and one could see whether, one could ask whether or not is there some sort of underlying theory. And indeed, that, that's uh, essentially what Hecke discovered. Hecke discovered a whole um, a spectrum of objects that look like this, but that's only still two-dimensional, and there's a higher dimensional version of all this. It's called the Langlands program. And so this development of this analogy is what is called the Langlands program. Another method of churning the mind is to transfer ideas. That method transfer takes one idea in one field and transports it into another field. Uh, so in some sense, you look for applications, whether in the theoretical realm or in the technological realm, and an example is provided by coding theory. In the 1950s, a fundamental problem was how to deal with errors in the transmission of a signal. Supposing you have a satellite that goes out to space, it's taking pictures of Mars or it's taking pictures of Jupiter, uh, and then it's trying to transmit those images back to Earth. And what happens is um, it'll meet with a lot of interference. There's the asteroid belt, for example, that lies beyond Mars. Uh, and so supposing it was trying to send you pictures back from Jupiter or Saturn, uh, the asteroid belt is in the way and therefore it will probably distort the signal and you will not get the picture that you wanted. So how do you deal with this uh, errors in the transmission of a signal? This problem was looked at in the 1950s and the person who came up with a, a brilliant answer was uh, Claude Shannon in 1948, Mathematical Theory of Communication. That's what, uh, he, it's a beautiful paper. If you have never heard of it, you might want to look into it, and it's a, it set the stage for a new topic of mathematics called coding theory. So one of the uh, remarkable discoveries after Shannon's paper was the, what's called the Reed-Solomon codes. So if I want to transmit a sequence of numbers a0 to a m minus 1, supposing these coordinates give you a picture of the rings of Saturn or something like that, so it's being transmitted by the Voyager spacecraft, and all of a sudden, by the time it reaches planet Earth, it could get distorted. So how do you how do you recover it? Well, it turns out that if you use finite fields, finite fields are always fields with um, prime or prime power elements. Um, and uh, the amazing thing about finite fields, or any field for that matter, is if you give me a polynomial of degree m, it will have uh, at most m roots. And so this simple algebraic theoretical idea uh, of pure mathematics was uh, transferred into uh, space technology by Reed and Solomon. And so what they did was they took the data point and they created a polynomial. And if G, now uh, it turns out that uh, finite fields are cyclic groups. Um, the multiplicative group of finite field is a cyclic group. And so take a generator G of the, of the field K and then transmit f of g, f of g squared, and dot, 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 f of g to the n, where n is, capital N is larger than the number of data point, uh, the number of coordinates, number of data points here. And then you can now reconstruct uh, with these values, you can try to reconstruct. You could even have more values than you need, and so that you can correct any of the uh, errors that have been made. So this is the what's called the theory of error correcting codes. 
Uh, so a famous theorem of Lagrange tells us that a polynomial of degree m can have at most m roots in a finite field, and we use that um, to combine the um, the data point and retrieve the original message accurately. By the way, this is also what is behind as all satellite transmission. Your cell phone is working on this principle. Cable television, compact discs, DVDs. In fact. All forms of data compression. How can you carry the entire cosmos in a single memory stick? Well, not the entire cosmos, but certainly a whole library can be made in a single memory stick. What are you doing here? You are compressing data. And the whole theory of data compression has to do with error correcting codes. It's all coming from transferring algebraic number theoretic ideas into some sort of technological applications. Okay, seventh method of discovering uh, um, new um, theorems is by the method of induction. Induction is really a method of generalization. Most familiar instance is mathematical induction, which I think all of you are pr pretty much familiar with. It seems to have been first discovered by Aryabhata in, in, the, in the fifth century. Uh, so he discovered, for example, one cubed plus two cubed is nine, which turns out to be a perfect square. I mean, did the next one, one cubed plus two cubed plus three cubed, it turns out to be 36, which turns out to be six squared, it's a perfect square again. So then he was led to uh, guess a formula. If, if I take all the n, uh, first n cubes and add them up, do I get a perfect square? And what kind, of n, uh, what kind of a square is it? Well, it's n times n plus one over two squared. And indeed, this is true, uh, and I'm sure you've seen this before, it can easily be proved by what is called mathematical induction. And a more interesting illustration is given by the L functions that I flashed in the previous slides. Remember, we, we have with Euler and Riemann and Ramanujan, they discovered special cases of a hierarchy of L functions that we now know exist correspond to GLN. And this is the famous Langlands program that I alluded to. The roots go back to Hecke uh, and his generalization of Ramanujan's work. And uh, it's followed up by uh, very profound and fundamental work of Harish Chandra. Uh, much of it, by the way, is, uh, some of it done at the Tata Institute in the 1950s, uh, and then uh, developed further by Robert Langlands in this famous uh, Langlands program, which was the uh, turning point in um, mathematics and number theory in the 1960s. The final method that I want to uh, put before you of churning the mind is what's called the converse method. So here, if we say, if we know that A implies B, we can always ask the question, does B imply A? And such a question often leads to profound discoveries. Now, a good example is provided by the discovery of electromagnetism. It was known in the 19th century that an electric current always creates a magnetic field. And so the converse question is, does a magnetic field create an electric current? And the answer is, sure enough, yes. It was answered in the affirmative by Michael Faraday. And uh, he was so excited by it. I mean, he developed the theory of electromagnetism, of course, which continued um, fundamental equations that govern electricity and magnetism are so-called famous Maxwell's equations. But before Maxwell, uh, Faraday had discovered uh, this interdependence between electricity and magnetism. And he was so excited, apparently, that he uh, demonstrated it uh, to the king um, an experiment to show that these things exist. And um, then um, the king apparently asked him the question, um, of what use is electricity? And then uh, Faraday, poor Faraday, uh, you know, being a scientist, he, all he, he was overjoyed by his discovery, but he didn't know what applications it would have. So he had to say something like this. He said, well, I really don't know at the moment what use electricity will be, but I'm sure that someday you're going to be taxing it. So this is a famous joke. I think it's probably true. Uh, and uh, sure enough, yes, that's exactly what happens with these uh, discoveries. We will not go into the political realm um, of um, uh, discoveries and their consequences. We will uh, keep our theme to the enjoyment of beauty of discovery. So this is the final method, the converse method of um, churning the mind. So let me summarize. Uh, I gave you the eightfold way, uh, the eightfold way of churning the mind. Uh, the first method was by survey. You take a topic that uh, captivates your attention. 
and you say, well, let's me, let me sit down and organize these facts because it seems to be all sorts of, it's all over the place. Uh, in fact, what we do when we give a course, uh, an undergraduate course, a graduate course in universities is we're taking material and organizing it. And each arrangement leads to new knowledge. This is a survey method of churning the mind. The next method is by careful observations. Careful observations lead to conjectures. Sometimes conjectures will force us to re-examine ideas which we took for granted and reinterpret them. And then we can find analogies, similarities, and we try to see uh, the underlying patterns of these analogies. We can take an idea that's already existing and see and if we can find applications for the idea, it's called a transfer method. We can apply the method of induction or generalization. We see a few things and we start to see maybe there's a more general pattern here. That's the method of induction. And we can always ask the converse question, if A implies B, uh, does B imply A? So if you uh, felt that uh, you should really have been taking notes, no need to take notes. Uh, the um, acronym for the method is uh, Socratic. And uh, so I'm sure now once you observe that, um, after you leave this lecture, you will remember all the points that have been made in this lecture. So let us churn our mind, journey inward, and there we will find gems of great discoveries. Thank you for your attention. So uh, let us all thank the speaker uh, for this beautiful talk. So uh, we can now uh, start taking questions. So I will first ask if the uh, panelists here had some questions in house. Not now. We can we'll after it. Okay, fine. So. Uh, I have, uh, they will be coming in, in YouTube as well as in the WebEx medium. So uh, maybe I can start uh, by uh, some of the questions that I had while going through the talk. So uh, you talked us about uh, beautiful proofs or beautiful theorems. So can you please elaborate how a beautiful proof can expand or enhance our understanding of a particular topic? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we have in mathematics, as you, as you know from your own experience, we have the idea of a proof and then you have the idea of a beautiful proof. Let's take uh, the idea of a proof. Uh, there's a famous um, theorem called the four color theorem. It was a conjecture for a long time. And uh, cartographers back in the 19th century noticed that if you take a map, you know, a map of India, a map of, um, you know, the world or whatever you have, and you have all these regions, the, let's say the provinces of India, and you want to color the map, and you want to color the map in such a way that no two adjacent regions get the same color. And so the question was, what's the minimum number of colors you, can, you need to use in order to color a map with that particular rule? called the proper coloring. And it was found that four colors were enough. So no matter what map you had, you can always color the map using four colors. Uh, that was an empirical observation. It was called a four color conjecture for a long time. And um, people tried to prove it. And it was finally proved in the 1970s by um, uh, unfortunately computer um, calculations. Of course, there was a lot of theoretical stuff behind it. I'm not saying I'm not devaluing the theoretical contributions that went into the proof of the four color theorem, but a good chunk of the final part of the proof is computer calculations and the computer calculations go into the, you know, 100,000 cases or something like that. And um, maybe it has been reduced by now. But uh, so we have a proof. We have a proof that every map can be co colored properly using only four colors. But it's not aesthetically pleasing because even though we have a proof, we don't have a beautiful proof. If you have a beautiful proof, you will understand what makes the whole thing tick. So there's another dimension of beauty that's important in research. Does that uh, help um, understand your question? Yes. Thank you. Yes. So I have another question here uh, uh, from YouTube. So uh, it is asked that how do you know that your question is good enough? 
Very good, good question. Um, you will know by the fertility of the uh, results. So for example, there are certain questions this time seems to be an important aspect of the process of discovery, you know, um, the time. time. When I say time, I mean historical period in which the question is asked. Uh, there are certain questions in uh, number theory right now that uh, seem to lead to a dead end. No one knows how to go about doing things. Uh, one is called the odd perfect number conjecture. So there's a a number is called perfect if you take all its divisors and add them up and if it comes out to be twice the original number, it's called a perfect number. And we know how to construct even perfect numbers. And uh, the question of whether there is an odd perfect number was a question that was, I think, implicitly posed by the ancient Greeks in Euclid's elements. Yet, uh, to this day, we have no clue as to how to proceed. Um, although there are results of numerical uh, Interesting results, no doubt, but uh, there's nothing that meets the criterion of beauty as I've defined it in this lecture. On the other hand, there's the question of, are there infinitely many uh, even perfect numbers, even though we have lots of even perfect numbers, are there infinitely many? Uh, we don't know how to answer that either. And so time doesn't seem to be the right time. We don't have the, it seems to be very, very sterile. These questions, they're good questions, we don't know the answers to them, but they seem to be sterile. Some other questions though, um, questions for example, posed by string theory right now, or the Ramanujan conjectures, or so, there's a certain time element, time fact, historical time, where all the tools are some, somehow in place. And these tools will then help us to uh, create a, a more, more fertile, let's say, um, uh, discovery. So there's a, there's a kind of, aspect of fertility of the question, where if the, if the question is leading to theoretical understanding, uh, it's fertile. But if it's leading to nothing, it's sterile for the time being. It could become fertile at a later stage. So there's always that component uh, that we have to take into consideration. Does that um, uh, help? Yes, thank you. So uh, one more question. It is asked that, uh, can you elaborate the relationship between Indian, ancient Indian philosophy and today's discovery? So how do they relate? Well, today's discovery in what? In philosophy or mathematics or science? Yeah, perhaps uh, that we see in our regular life. That we are using. Well, well, certainly, yeah. Philosophy, philosophy is uh, essentially uh, uh, provides us with an attitude with which we can try to approach life and its mystery, isn't it? Uh, just as we in mathematics, we find something very um, puzzling, uh, curious to, and we don't understand certain patterns of numbers. Uh, we try to understand them through the uh, telescope mathematics. Uh, with philosophy, uh, there are many things in life that we don't find uh, comprehensible. Um, life itself is a mystery and philosophy uh, offers us some sort of framework with which we can meet some of the aspects, some of the mysterious aspects of life. Now, in that, from that standpoint, well, having said that, I would then say that Indian philosophy offers a, a very profound um, telescope. Uh, maybe um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a super telescope of sorts. Uh, and there's something certainly um, to be gained by such a study. Uh, as I said, uh, the person being educated is yourself. Uh, and uh, so in that process is a journey, um, the, the, the journey seems to be inward and the journey seems to be a journey into your own mind. So in that sense, philosophy, Indian philosophy in particular, seems to offer um, that kind of um, remarkable treasure trove of, um, possibilities and potentialities. Okay. So, so Murthy, just one question, you know, I think in the same context, uh, even Ramanujan's brain is thinking process. Has there been any effort to understand, you know, he was a completely untrained kind of a person and how was he able to, you know, do those most intricate problems, which even the greatest of brains couldn't do that. I mean, has anyone tried to understand, you know, what was the thinking process? How did he discover so much? I mean, or is it some tapasya, some sadhana, 
even the ancient indians you know, the aryabhata and all of them uh, used to do all of that okay is there a particular process to something like that which we have lost now in the modern era with uh, with all the kinds of distractions that we have uh, yeah it's a, it's a good, very good question i think you you put your finger on the uh, word the word is distraction exactly and and we have so many distractions and it goes back to my first point, the, the three ABC of research, avadhanam, anandam, I, uh, and uh, adhyayanam. So the, the, the idea is first the two aspects, the attention, if it's distractive, if the attention is scattered, you know, to, today we have cell phones to distract us, computers to distract us, television, so radio, and so on and so forth. We have too many things to distract us. Uh, and if, if we can focus our attention uh, and and channel it and 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 enjoy and that's the important the attention and anandam seem to go together if you appreciate beauty it already channels your attention if you focus your attention you try to start perceiving beauty so these two uh, anandam and attention seem to be connected now if you go back to the ancient times uh, they were lucky because they had fewer uh, uh, distractions. We have too much technology with us. Uh, they were probably uh, had the leisure to reflect. And that's that silence. Uh, silent reflection is very important. Now, in the case of Ramanujan, uh, even though he was so-called unlettered, uh, he educated himself. He was a self-taught. I, 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 he didn't go to school in the formal sense of the word, uh, but he, he certainly went to school. But he taught himself many things. Uh, and, and most of you know that the book that transformed his life is what's called the Carr Synopsis of Pure Mathematics. Um, and Carr Synopsis is a kind of a compendium. It's an encyclopedic uh, listing of main theorems that students that want to enter the PhD program in Cambridge University, they usually use this Carr Synopsis to train themselves. Now, if you look at Carr synopsis, it's, it's got about 5,000 pages or so, and uh, 5,000 theorems. And uh, so Ramanujan kind of worked through the whole thing. So if you can work through 5,000 theorems like that and discover what Euler had discovered, what Jacobi had discovered, what all the, you know, the 18th and 19th century mathematicians had discovered for yourself, you discovered them yourself, you have uh, more education than uh, any university uh, degree can offer you. So he was a self-taught uh, genius, and they're the best kind because, in some sense, we're all uh, universities can offer you the facilities, but they really can't teach you. You know, you can, as they say, you can take the horse to the water, but you can't make the ho horse drink it. Um, we offer, um, you know, aliment, food, nutrition for the mind in the way of courses, uh, but the student really has to. Um, kind of um, digest the material, enjoy enjoy the meal, as it were. So I think the aspect of anandam is really at the heart of um, this kind of discovery. I mean, and I think whether it's any genius, whatever that word may mean, uh, has tapped in to the sense of beauty in the process of discovery. Okay, so uh, one more question. So we have... Uh... YouTube that so Shireen Datta wants to know could you please share your opinion regarding the link between one's intuition and discovery so how to travel yeah. that path yeah I think um, intuition is an interesting word isn't it um, and how does one get intuition well you get intuition by um, at least I'm, I'm not claiming I know the answer uh, but at least intuition seems to come from appreciation of beauty. Uh, you know, G.H. Hardy, uh, there was this famous joke about Hardy uh, visiting Ramanujan in England and um, saying that he just came in a taxi cab number 1729 and was, uh, looked like a very boring number and Ramanujan, and Ramanujan said on the contrary, it's the smallest number that can be written as a sum of two cubes in two different ways. And uh, this prompted G.H. Uh, Hardy uh, to say that um, uh, every number seemed to be Ramanujan's personal friend. And that's the, I think that's the idea. The idea is that romance 
you know, your, the, the science that we study, whether it's mathematics, whether it's philosophy, whether it's physics, whether it's chemistry and so on and so forth, if we have a certain romance with the, with the knowledge um, and that, uh, that leads to a certain personalization, uh, the ideas become your personal friends and that personal relationship may be called intuition and that certainly will lead you to insights. You, if, you, if you go to your teacher and bang your fist on the desk and say, I want to learn everything, the teacher's not going to give it to you. Um, they will just give you the bare minimum. But if you were to, uh, you know, um, inquire in a humble sort of way and the student, see, uh, the teacher sees that the student is uh, struggling and uh, groping with uh, the material, the teacher may try and help. And in that process, the symbiotic relation of um, uh, mutual respect and, uh, and knowledge, uh, some sort of intuition will then emerge. I think so that romance is the is the ingredient, it seems to me, for um, intuition. Even that intuition also comes only to a prepared mind. I think. <laughs> exactly. You, do, you read, you do so much, you keep thinking about it. And suddenly that intuition strikes you, you know, which, which can lead to something more interesting. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that the, the problem with our ed present system of education is, is we don't foster intuition. We foster cramming. You know, mm -hmm. the student is, uh, you know, has to take a half a dozen courses and they're, and they're cramming to pass an exam. And so the whole thing fixated on uh, passing exams. I mean, just like this, uh, the Olympic Games right now. I mean, the the poor athletes there. You're, you know, if they're fixated on winning a medal, they may lose the concentration. You see, but if you if you do things for the pure joy of doing, uh, irrespective of what happens, then that leads to uh, that. Of course, all of this, as you say correctly, uh, intuition uh, has to be preceded by. Uh, discipline, uh, organized uh, discipline of some, some, some sort. Okay, so one more question. So uh, it is said that some proof of theorems in mathematics have completely new constructions, so uh, which has very little to do with what has already been done. So how do you come up with these kind of things? Yeah, that's a very good question. That falls into the category of reinterpretation. Um, you know, there's a famous uh, mathematician by the name of Alexander Grothendieck. Hold on for a second. I have to, I may have. <coughs> Hello. Hello. Sorry about that. Um, so there's a famous mathematician by the name of Alexander Grothendieck who um, used to say, that if you have a particular problem, uh, you have to find the right language with which to formulate the, la uh, formulate the problem. And if you formulate the problem correctly, the answer will pop out. So that's, a, that's actually reinterpretation. That means you're going to reinterpret the problem in a different perspective. Um, that uh, requires, uh, those are uh, significant episodes in the history of science. I, I gave the example of Einstein's theory of relativity where Newtonian physics was supplanted by a new way, uh, way of looking at space and time and gravity too. Uh, and in mathematics we've also seen this kind of thing, the notion of a group, you know, uh, algebras, the notion of representations and so on and so forth. All of these uh, are discoveries that lead to um, a new perspective and that is essentially at the heart of reinterpretation. That, uh, that yes. Sir. Yeah. So uh, maybe I can ask uh, one more question. So, uh, in your opinion, what is more important, a proof or the statement? Both. Both are. You see, so the question is statement of the proof and the proof. Uh, so proof is one thing, and I th and I emphasize the beautiful proof. You see, we want. We want the statement, we want the proof, we want a beautiful proof. So the first step might be getting a proof, no matter how you got it, you at least have a proof. But the next step is to clean up the proof to make it so obvious that a single glance is enough to say, of course. You see, that is really the test of understanding. 
when you can say, of course, it's obvious. But when you, well, how are you saying that it's obvious? You have a particular perspective and you're viewing that from that particular perspective. It goes back to the growth and uh, philosophy psychology, where if you understand the problem, how to pose it correctly, the solution is obvious. And that kind of idea goes back to this uh, particular thing. We want proofs, but we want beautiful proofs. So the, the aesthetic component in research is a real uh, feature. Okay, thank you, Professor Murthy. We will end with one uh, in-house question. So, so can you please elaborate on the cartoon that you showed us unanswered questions and unquestioned answers? So how do we really take this? Well, uh, some, it, 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 I would like to take it as uh, don't, don't overlook trivialities. Hello, hello. Yeah, don't overlook trivialities. Uh, we tend to, we tend to uh, think we know certain things, but we may not know them. You see, so if we, uh, I would say that particular cartoon uh, warns us uh, not to be complacent in our understanding and knowledge and don't think that we have everything, we know everything. Even before Einstein uh, came up with this theory, many physicists were of the view that uh, we've reached the pinnacle of knowledge because we figured out how the universe works. Well, then all of a sudden there was this Michelson-Morley business that throws a monkey wrench into the understanding. So I think the, uh, the danger of research is a certain sense of complacency in thinking that we have a particular theory which will explain everything. We have a particular uh, concept that will explain everything. No, everything is in evolution. Everything is in flux and uh, not to take things trivially not to overlook simple things. Um, even the idea of two plus two is a very profound, is a profound idea. The idea of a number is a very profound idea. The idea of addition is a num is a very profound idea. So when we when we start looking at things from the uh, profundity of basic concepts, we open the door. We open the door for. Um, uh, looking at what we think are answers, and we can then question the answers. Uh, much of you know, uh, religious um, formal religions are f fall under this category. We don't have all the answers. Uh, science takes a more humble approach, uh, and uh, Indian philosophy, by the way, uh, also took a very humble approach. Uh, we don't know many things. Okay, sir. Thank you very much. So, with this, I'll uh, hand it over to Professor Roy. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Amurthy. It was it was a wonderful lecture. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, we had, in fact, a record number of people attending both on our WebEx link and our YouTube link. So, even though we were presenting a lot of, I would say, abstract ideas, all of us could relate to it, even if we are from different disciplines. But I think we all had our personal examples and our little research experience relating to the different points that we were making about uh, the way uh, research is uh, question need to be addressed and so on. So thank you, Professor Ramurthy, again for your time. Uh, it's, it was very engaging and we all learned a lot. Uh, really appreciate your, your, your engaging with us and delivering the Institute lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.